My name is Paul Ellison. I'm a lecturer in music history at San Francisco State University and also director of music at Church of the Advent of Christ the King in San Francisco. Two thousand and five is the five hundredth anniversary of the death of Thomas Tallis, and at a forthcoming Tallis Scholars concert, uh, we will be celebrating this anniversary with two major works of Tallis. I'd like to put some of these works in the context for which they were written. Tallis served under four English monarchs: Henry the Eighth, who took the uh, Church out of the Roman Catholic tradition and started the Anglican Church; Edward the Sixth, who was an Anglican; Mary the first, who was a Roman Catholic, and finally Elizabeth the first, who was an Anglican. And every time the monarch changed, the uh, religious tradition changed at that time. And so Tallis had to be a very flexible composer. He was equally adept at writing in English, which was the language used by the Church of England, or Latin, the language used by the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, he was one of the first composers to write in the English language. Puernatus Est was written for Christmas 1554, based on the Gregorian introit of the day. In translation it means, a boy was born to us, and a son given to us, whose government will be on his shoulders. This was written because Queen Mary already suspected she was pregnant. Both Mary and Philip were anxious for a male heir who could inherit the two kingdoms of Spain and England and form an alliance at that time. So Tallis chose his text very carefully, both to honour Christmas Day and the forthcoming prospect of a royal infant being born. Et filius datus est nobis. Travelling with Philip at that time were members of his choir and composers from Europe. Tallis, as an Englishman, wanted to impress them that he was certainly capable of writing in the continental tradition. He uses a device that's often used by composers on the continent, a canon in the upper two voices. A canon is where a melody is imitated directly, in this case at six beats distance. And six beats later, the other mean voice, a mean is a low treble voice at that time, the other mean comes in and imitates it directly. And the composers travelling with Philip at this time would have recognised this device and would have been impressed with what Tallis was doing. The second work I'd like to consider, which will be part of the Cal Performances concert, are the Lamentations of Jeremiah. The scholars are in disagreement as to exactly what the context of their composition was. There are two schools of thought. The first is that they were for tenebrae of Holy Week. However, some scholars think that it's a political message uh, to the Roman Catholic community about what had happened in England. In 1570, the Pope excommunicated Queen Elizabeth and the Church of England. Tallis was what is known as a recusant Catholic somebody who doesn't acknowledge the Anglican Church at that time and still maintains his own faith, the Roman Catholic faith, which he was brought up with. If you want to try and identify with this particular school of thought, just imagine a change being made to the last line of the Lamentations. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, convertere a dominum deum tuum, which means Jerusalem, Jerusalem, turn back to the Lord your God. If we were to change it to England, England, turn back to the Lord your God, you can get this subliminal political message that some scholars think this piece is presenting. Traditionally, Hebrew letters are set because Hebrew letters appear in the text rather like a way of marking each verse. Instead of numbering them one, two, three, we use the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Bet, 
etc. And the word Aleph is set in polyphony, and it gives Talis an opportunity to write a wonderfully expressive point of imitation, which is where the voices imitate one another, without having to worry about the text that he's setting, because Aleph doesn't have any significance or meaning at this point. As soon as Aleph has been set, he has to start setting the text of the Lamentations, which is fairly lengthy, and so he reverts to what's called homophonic setting or syllabic setting, where each syllable has one or at most a few notes in order to express the text in a faster fashion. The remainder of the work is a contrast between these two styles of writing. Talis's contemporary, William Byrd, was actually a student of Talis, and they combined together on various publications throughout their lifetimes. They were also both gentlemen of the Chapels Royal. And this elite group of singers that followed the monarch around from venue to venue, providing the music for worship services. Bird was also a recusant Catholic, a rather more devout one than Talis, and in fact was prosecuted for this during his lifetime. We're going to hear Bird's motet, Ave Verum Corpus, which will be part of the Cal Performances concert. In order to explain how he sets this text, we need to understand just what it meant to him. For Bird, the Blessed Sacrament, which is the consecrated bread at the Mass, contained the real presence of Christ. The first phrase of the piece, Ave Verum Corpus, means hail true body. And for Bird, the most important word wasn't Ave or Corpus, but Verum because the word true meant that it was the true or real presence of Christ in this bread. This was one of the main differences between the Anglican Church and the Roman Catholic Church. And he wanted to emphasize this word verum in the first phrase. And he did it by using a particularly expressive device. The device is called false relation. And a false relation is where a note and its chromatically altered note appear very close to one another. In this case, F sharp, and F natural. The great English scholar Donald Francis Tovey once commented on the vicious English taste for false relations. Uh, they would put them in many, many contexts where their continental contemporaries would not use them. Bird and Talis both do this. We've heard them in these pieces using the expressive device of the false relation. And it was something that marked English music out as particularly expressive. <laughs> 